Don't you, Mr. Cameron? Um, <laughs> right, first of all, I think it's very important from time to time that we should pause and reflect, perhaps, on the fact that John Kennedy was a human being. For example, when we look at the Supruna film, we we often look at it with an analytical eye, trying to work out where the shots came from, how many shots there were, and so on and so on. But we're also watching a film of a man being killed. And uh, it's, it, the tragedy of that event, I think, sometimes gets buried when we're trying to find out the truth of what happened. So I think it's important that we occasionally remember John Kennedy as a man. Um, I'm very proud to be a member of this group. For over 20 years this group has been at the forefront of responsible research into President Kennedy's assassination. We believe in the free exchange of information surrounding his death and we have some of the most respected and prolific researchers amongst our members. Our journal, The Echo, is a highly respected publication dedicated to the search for truth surrounding this appalling crime. Two years ago we published our first book on the subject, and I emphasise the word first because I hope there's going to be more, called JFK Echoes from Elm Street. But it's subtitled, A Search for Historical Accuracy surrounding the assassination. <coughs> Historical accuracy, I think, is crucial. This book, I believe, is a fitting tribute to the memory of JFK, and I want to thank all my fellow collaborators for their superb contributions. Today, I don't want to dwell on who, or speculate who was responsible for JFK's death. We, in this group, and other researchers all over the world, of course, are going to continue that debate. I would prefer today to concentrate on the fact that John F. Kennedy lived and to explore the positive impact his life had on the world. Many tributes have been paid to John F. Kennedy. Some of the most poignant were expressed when the memory of this remarkable leader was still fresh when the shock of his sudden death was perhaps at its most painful. Two friends of uh, JFK, the journalist Mary McGrory and the artist William Walton, they were attending his funeral at Arlington Cemetery on the 25th of November 1963. They were standing near the grave site with the Kennedy family and dignitaries from all over the world. When McGrory turned to Walton and asked him, Bill, what are we doing at Jack Kennedy's funeral? This anguished remark, I believe, encapsulates a terrible sense of loss that many people felt at this unbelievably tragic event. Since uh, President Kennedy's death, many monuments have been erected to him. This bus in London, which was sculptured by Jacques Lipchitz and unveiled by Robert and Edward Kennedy on the 15th of May 1965, is London's permanent memorial to him. The names of streets and squares all over the world were changed to honour his memory. Special coins and medals were struck with his image. There's even a mountain in Canada which is named after him. I want to propose answers to some important questions. Why is President Kennedy still mourned? Why, several generations later, people still regard the Kennedy years with nostalgia? Why is his leadership still relevant more than 53 years or nearly 53 years after his death? After all, he was president for little more than a thousand days, and his legislative record is regarded by many as unimpressive. Was Kennedy 
more style than substance? Did he possess more charm than ability? More profile than courage? No. I believe he was far more than just a charismatic man. He brought to politics something which is shamefully lacking at the present time, respectability and integrity. Above all, he possessed that rare ability to inspire. Referring to those who would become part of his administration, he stated in his inaugural address on January the 20th, 1961, in the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. I do not shrink from this responsibility, I welcome it. I do not believe that any of us would exchange places with any other people or any other generation. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavour will light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. I remember vividly at the age of 10 being struck by the eloquence of that speech. I remember too the feeling of optimism during those few short years he was president. Of course this may have been partly due to my own idealistic youth and to my future hopes and aspirations, but it really was good to be part of a young generation in the early 60s. We felt that war belonged to our parents' generation. We enjoyed freedom. We had youthful energy. I could do with some of that now, actually. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but most importantly, we had John Kennedy as leader of the Free West. And when he went on to say, ask not, my, sorry, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. My fellow citizens of the world, ask not what America can do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. He did indeed inspire us to change the world. Now when I think back to that time, a line from Chariots of Fire comes to mind. When we certainly did have hope in our hearts, and wings on our heels. I think many would agree that there have been few inspirational leaders since John Kennedy's death. He set a high standard that has proved to be very difficult to emulate. Why is this? What was so special about this man? Was it because he died a martyr's death when he was still young? and had so much more to offer. This may be partly true for his youth undoubtedly contributed to his appeal. Compared to other leaders at that time, he appeared even younger. And while he did indeed possess an appealing persona <coughs> and had a graceful wife and small children, his appeal transcended mere superficiality the primary reason, I believe, for his high regard is that President Kennedy was a man of his time. By that, I mean a leader who achieved power and responsibility at a crucial period in human history, when the stakes were high, when true leadership was desperately needed. We were so fortunate, and I cannot emphasize this point too strongly, to have JFK as leader of the free world in the early 1960s. A man who possessed the humanity and the courage to resist the forces of evil, and I mean evil, that were pressurizing him into mankind's ultimate failure.
Kennedy achieved, in my opinion, true greatness during his presidency. He matured from a political leader into an international statesman during his administration, so that by 1963 he had reached the pinnacle of his political life. The peaceful conclusion of the missile crisis, the full support of his administration behind the struggle for civil rights, his speech at the American University, one of the finest speeches any leader has given at any time, followed a few months later by the signing of the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, all contributed to ensuring John Kennedy's rightful place in history. But what we could not foresee was that towards the end of November 1963, his historical legacy would also be secured by tragedy. Kennedy was a victim of those forces who rejected peace and justice for all, and as a consequence of the manner of his death, we are all victims. I said at the start that I did not want to speculate on who was responsible for JFK's death. But I will say this. Another phrase that Kennedy used in his inaugural address was, with history, the final judge of our deeds. It is my fervent hope that when the perpetrators of JFK's assassination are finally judged by history, magnanimity will not play a role in its verdict. John Kennedy effectively sacrificed the remainder of his life for the benefit of all mankind and the generations that followed his. So if I were to be asked, was Kennedy a great leader? I can reply with genuine justification. Oh yes, he truly was. <clears throat> because of what JFK achieved for mankind, I think it is appropriate to end with the words that were traditionally spoken at the end of his press conferences. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, brother.